Hello, Mike Rasmussen here. Um, I am reaching out um, to do this uh, presentation today. Um, this is my vlogcast. I'm actually doing this um, in a restaurant today. But I wanted to talk about what we've been facing for these last few um, years and why everything has been a little bit crazy. So if you're in talent acquisition at all and you've seen what we've been through, you'll know that everything feels like a roller coaster ride right now. And things are very strange and different and unique. So that's really what we're facing right now. And so there's a lot going on. And so right now is a, a very important time. So let me get into the slides. I'll, I'll walk you through um, what the challenges really are and what I've seen. And I've collected some data that I think will be very interesting. Um, it shows that this is an old presentation. I was at the source and recruit company, I'm no longer there, but I do wanna go through this and walk you through what the reality is that we're facing. So let's get into it. So this is a little bit about me. Um, I started in TA and HR in 2004 as an intern at Applied Materials, graduated from San Jose State University, hence the stuff that's on. Um, just repping my uh, college. Graduated um, from San Jose State University with a bachelor's in HR, 18 years in TA, HR, and agency and internal recruiting functions also as a generalist. Presented at SourceCon and ERE conferences, as well as the um, HR.com high volume event. So what, are, what am I gonna talk about? What challenges are likely to exist in coming years? What are the trends that affect TA strategy in coming years? How will tech, demographics, changing customer preference all affect your strategy? Do you have to prepare for high volume hiring and hiring general? What do you do? 10 tips to help you prepare. Strategies to get buy-in with senior leadership. HR talent strategy isn't just a cost center, it's tied to revenue. Led your key partners, corporate strategy, finance, and line leaders to tell the story. This is really what we're going through right now. It's just such an interesting time. Um, I... I just find it fascinating that we've dealt with all these things in just such a short period of time. It's just an interesting uh, reality. Um, the more I look at it and the more I've seen, um, it's just, it's been chaotic. You go back to 2020, you see what happened then. Um, there was just a, a crazy set of circumstances for talent and talent acquisition. And everybody um, faced a reactive state, which then swung to the other side. Um, it was a candidate's market for a while. Employers couldn't find enough help. They swung back to the other uh, situation where inflation and the Fed started to change interest rates. And so that changed really what we were facing at the time. And so it's just an interesting situation. We've just been dealing with a lot of craziness and it's just all calm at the same time. And all these events have kind of put us in a very strange place from a talent perspective. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. I'm gonna get into the weeds. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna show you some data and what that means and why um, it is the way it is and why it feels like uh, talent acquisition professionals are going through a tough time right now. Not just us, but job seekers and anyone in any career position has seen um, just a, a crazy set of circumstances. It feels like you're in a recession or not officially but it's all because of these circumstances where employers are being more careful. There's definitely more things to deal with, a lot of uh, strategic scenarios. So being able to understand this stuff and be able to talk about it and talk about it openly and honestly is very important because it's also um, affected such things as mental health. Um, it's been a huge issue on the stage of, you know, just uh, employee retention and people just being their best selves. So let me get into that more. I'll go to my next slide here. So these are the headlines. Um, I want to talk about these. I mean, look at look at all these. And as you start to see, um, I think it's just an amazing situation that we've been through. Uh, look at all these headlines that have been in the past three years. And and when you look at all of these, you know, you, you start thinking of various things like there was the great resignation, there was quiet quitting, uh, there was the great retirement. Uh, there's all these different words and what they mean. But th this just goes to show you that the influx and the shock of going through the challenges that we faced. So the shock that I'm talking about is COVID-19. It changed things overnight. It changed the way that 
talent was being utilized, it changed the way that organizations were looking at um, just their flexibility of work schedules. And all these different things have all come, you know, full circle. And it's just been an insane craziness of events that have all come to pass all at the same time. And when you look at these uh, these headlines, it's this is this is the reality. This is what we've been facing. This has been in our face constantly. And and what I'm trying to do today is give some equip not only job seekers but organizations with better um, ways of dealing with these problems because this is the reality. And it it's it feels very schizophrenic. It feels very crazy. But when you look at these headlines, you go, wow, these are these are crazy situations. And what do we do with this? Um, it, it all comes down to being human in the talent acquisition process. It all comes down to leaders being good leaders and doing the right thing with their employees. It means helping um, uh, with coping strategies. It, it means investing in your people. It means taking time to actually do the right thing and, you know, have remote work still be at the forefront. It may mean investing time and energy in all these different things. But what's happening is right now, many of these organizations feeling the pinch, you know, they invested in their talent acquisition, then they pulled back um, right when the Fed started cutting rates because their funding was drying up. So all the free money is gone. So now you have to adapt and you have to be flexible. And that also means for you as a career person, you know, in your day-to-day -day job, if you've been laid off or you've had something happen, you have to really think differently about what you're going to do in your life and how you're going to approach things. You almost have to be the CEO of your own life. You have to take action and be consistent. And that is very, very, very important. And that is the problem. I mean, we, we need to figure out how to do these things. So people who have been used to uh, having the same job for years and years and years in the same company, that's no longer the reality. You have to be flexible and adaptable and figure out how to be the entrepreneur of your own life. You may even have to think of new ways of bringing in income. For me, gig economy work. For others, it may be flipping, uh, going off on a classified ad place, picking up some furniture, flipping the furniture online, making profit in new ways, uh, investing in dividend stocks, which pay for your time and energy to invest in those. So these are all the things that we're dealing with. Um, these are the headlines, but let me jump into the next uh, slide here and I'll show you some more. TA trends. So these are the trends um, that we're going to talk through today. Um, I really wanted to talk about this. I really wanted to, to put this out there because I think these are trends that are real. This is real data that I've collected. And I did this presentation in a couple different places, but I hope it's interesting. And whoever watches this later, you'll see why this is such a key an important thing to know. The data tells a story. It tells what happened and the why behind it. So let's get into that. So here's here's some data initially that I think is key. The great retirement. What happened with experienced professionals in 2020? Um, many of these folks were looking to leave the labor force for, for a while. The pandemic did affect retirements. They did leave in droves. So you see that dotted line? That was the expected retirement. Um, the line above it is the actual retirement. So many of these older generations started to leave the workforce more, but then they came back to the workforce because they weren't inten intending to entirely go away. So it's what it's basically showing us is the pandemic uh, opened up more roles that hadn't been there before. And it was a a schizophrenic reality and a reaction that happened fast. So as you can see, this is this is all very important to talk about. And, and this is why I'm addressing this real time in this way. So let's go to the next slide and I'll show you another trend. Rise of generations. What we've seen in the last few years um, is first of all, more than 80% of the US pre-retiree households are financially unprepared for a secure retirement. What that basically means, this is as of 2022, these numbers haven't changed much, but really there's, they don't really have a safety net. They don't have as much savings as they'd want. Um, the rise of interest rates has lowered the amount of savings. And we're now at an all-time high in terms of debt across the board 
with everybody. So everybody's feeling the pinch. Everybody's feeling these things. It's not just all these things. Gen Z is also to rise. And look at the uh, trend line there, how Gen Z is going to continue to grow um, as, a, as a, an influencer in the workforce. Gen Z, Gen Y will be very important going forward. Here's some other stuff. So let me go to the next slide here. These are just some summary of, of what um, this is trying to say. I mean, the aging of baby boomers means that within just a couple decades, older people are projected to outnumber children for the first time. So what does that basically mean? It means that your grandma, your grandpa, your, the folks who've been um, you know, with you are, may have to live with their children. Um, it also means that's going to put pressure on the lower generations, the younger generations, the ones that are up and coming, and they're going to have to work more and figure out how to get to these things. So um, you could see this uh, trend line with the gig economy. So, you know, a few years ago, not as many people were doing the gig economy work, more and more are doing gig economy work now as a result of that top line there and that, that information about you know, the 78 million people, 65 years and older, um, by 2035, more and more people will get involved. And it's already started. So that, that trend line earlier, where the actual retirement went up uh, versus what was expected, that means there's more pressure on households. And, the, you know, you have more caregivers giving care. You have more families trying to make ends meet. You've got younger parents still trying to raise kids. You got all these different things. Just really interesting trend lines. Look at these are very important trends and they're they're interesting to look at the median age too will rise from 38. That means that more people are getting married later in life. And that also affects the available talent pool. So all interesting stuff. Let me jump to the next slide here. This may be boring for some of you, but I think it's important. Just stick with me. Generational, what does this all mean? What do, what do these um, trend lines mean that I put out there? Generational shifts in the workforce are underway. Generational um, shifts across the labor pool. Brain drain may result from retirements in the labor force by the baby boomer generation and the millions very quickly. The great retirement will accelerate need to train the younger generation now. Tech roles will be harder to fill. Volume roles will become more critical for your succession plan funnel. You know, the up and comers, you'll need to train them. You're going to need to invest in them. You can't act in a vacuum. The reality is that so many organizations right now are acting in a vacuum and it's really, really crazy. Um, you could go to one LinkedIn. Uh, um, I'll, I'll go to some LinkedIn postings after this and I'll show you how many folks are applying to jobs. And then the, the problem is that the more and more applications there are, you know, these these organizations scaled back their recruiters. The recruiters have more work to do. Time to fill goes longer. The inefficiency is here. This is the problem. So the great retirement will accelerate the need to drain younger generations. Tech roles will be harder to fill. Challenges we didn't anticipate are transforming the workplace right now. Workplace is one, uh, remote work is one example. Let me show you some slides for that. Most teleworkers in the U.S. say working from home helps them balance their work and personal lives. Now, there's a big push for CEOs to bring people back into the uh, office. So back during COVID, it was kind of a normal thing. People were used to it. But there's a growing share of U.S. workers who are working a hybrid schedule. As you can see, these, these, um, the Pew Research Center and has done a good job of breaking down what is the reality in telework um, and how people feel about it. You know, it really is a thing where everybody in the workforce who has any kind of professional job, if you're trying to hire talent across the board, remote work's here to stay, folks. It's not going away. Those of you who aren't used to it, you have to get used to it. It's going to stay here and it's going to be a differentiator for your talent pool. The, the organizations that do offer uh, remote work are going to have an easier time being competitive than those who don't. And that is the biggest issue. See, this is one example of, of where inflexibility is going to hurt your talent pool. And it has. It's just the reality. It's what's happening real time. 
Let me jump to the next slide here, and I want to show you some more stuff. Of job holders in the United States, 58% or the equivalent of 92 million people say they can work remotely at least part of the time. This was as of 2022. In 2023, there were a lot of CEOs who were trying to pull people back into the office, and they were saying, oh, we will let you go if you don't come to the office. Now, what happens with that is that there's a big brain drain scenario where talent is going to actually go to the places that treat them like human beings and treat them well. The CEOs who do treat people with respect and do uh, let people do a hybrid schedule, it can be argued that a hybrid schedule is actually more productive for organizations than organizations who limit remote work. And that is where the trend line is actually headed. So it's important to note that many organizations are not offering remote work and the ones who do offer remote work are monitoring their people. So there's a level of trust and a level of professionalism that comes with this. Now, I think it just depends on the role. You know, how, how often can, you know, you got to evaluate and do look at, do a role uh, evaluation and look at the reality of what these folks are going through and the why for talent development and being able to c retain your people. Because right now this is an important issue and it's not going away. So this is this is why you can see 58% at some point have worked remotely. And that trend line should continue to go up, but some CEOs are pulling it back. So it's you have to find a, a nice middle ground for your organization and make sure you, you are expressing the why to decision makers and the business case for why remote work is effective because it saves time and money. It also saves on space, big office spaces. It also opens up your available talent pool and gives you more options to choose from. That is the reality. So next uh, slide for me. Um, among the employers who are given the option to work remotely, 87% of folks take their employers up on that offer. This was as of 2022. So this is not, I don't think this has changed much, um, but you know, this just gives you the share of those who do work remotely and what their options are and why. And so this is where a lot of this is coming from. So I wanna make sure that you, you kind of see how important this is and, and the trend line because of it. Now, if you're, if you're uh, an employee um, and, and you've been in an organization where your CEO is pulling back from the remote work trend line that that existed back in 2020. You see what's happening now is, you know, the employers think, oh, well, you know, we have more available talent. We can we can do as we choose. But still, the, the reality is you have to evaluate honestly, is this going to work for your organization and why? And what is the ROI? you know, and get to the bottom of it and look at the trend lines and, and does it help you attract talent? See, this knee jerk reaction where the pendulum is swung one way where everybody was doing remote work back to the other way where people are limiting it to some degree and then hybrid is coming up. Here's where the reality comes into play. It is a talent issue. It is a reality. What is the job what does it require? What is the supervision needed? Do uh, your workers have the option to work remotely and why? And, and what's the benefit to your organization? What is also the cost savings? So you see all these issues, you have to kind of be able to communicate well and look at the trend lines, go to your, look at your organizations, your sites, uh, your your regional comparisons. You might have to go to a regional level to explain all this to a CFO. So this is why this is so key and important. Next slide for me. So I wanna run through this one. Here's where uh, the source uh, for this data is McKinsey and Company June 22, 2022 report. Remote work will remain as a circumstance, 87% of those given the option to work remotely, take that up on the offer. So in other words, it can be a differentiator for uh, remote work or for talent retention and also for uh, engaging your folks that work for you. And these are some trend lines. Um, these are the, it's just a pretty good barometer 
of what was happening in 2022. I don't know if they have an updated version of this, but it's just a pretty good barometer to see where this was all going. So if you look at the bottom, you know, your full-time and your part-time workers, uh, even farming, farming, fishing, and forestry, a very outdoor role, we're doing some kind of remote work. Um, healthcare, uh, some of them are doing remote work. You can see it's affected all these different spaces now and the business services, you know, like retail settings, maybe restaurant settings, probably not as likely to see remote work. However, this is important to keep an eye on because it's becoming more and more important for the millennial talent who are up and comers and those who are in Gen X and Gen Y, this is a very important thing for them. And being able to offer it is key to retention and happiness and your overall employee health. I want to suggest to you that, you know, hybrid work um, is a good thing. So it enables organizations to get the benefits of the work from home, but it also gets the benefits of the work in office where you've got some camaraderie and connection and human connection. So I think when you're managing a remote team, it's very important to remember engagement is key. You know, engagement with the job itself and finding meaning in your work. Those are all key issues still. They're not going away. So being able to, to harness this and not push it to the side is very important. That's why these, these stats matter. So here's a few more. Revenue increases from adopting AI. Now here's another trend line. AI is becoming increasingly important. Artificial intelligence is also not going away. The rise of chat GPT, for example, is helping with a lot of different issues. So why are these, I mean, these issues just keep coming up. There's a whole host of issues that come from artificial intelligence and these, these trend lines of all these different things. So as you're looking at these things, you know, look at these various areas, you know, marketing and sales, there's definitely an impact of a revenue increase, product and service development, revenue increase. Uh, there's also a decrease in costs, say, you know, in costs, there's a, a cost saving option, there's a cost saving opportunity. So artificial intelligence can be introduced, but you can't rely on it entirely, because there's also hallucinations which come up, which basically, if you haven't, if you don't know what that term means, a hallucination in artificial intelligence is where uh, chat GPT or the, the artificial intelligence tool uh, spits out something that's partially accurate, not entirely accurate based on its limited information. So very key, um, you have to guide the artificial intelligence. It's not going to replace humans necessarily. I think it's going to enhance what we do. But even if you're a professional, you also need to be aware of the reality of artificial intelligence and how it's affecting your work and your world. So that's what this slide's all about. Next one that I want to talk about is this slide. So these are 10 tips for your success in preparing. I went through all these trend lines went through them fairly quickly. I don't know who's going to watch this video. Hopefully a few will later, but this is a SWOT analysis. Um, so SWOT analysis is what strategy professionals use to look at their world. And I, I suggest you can do this for your career as well. You know, if you've been laid off, do a SWOT analysis. What is it? What are your risks? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are your opportunities? What are your threats? Um, if you're going for a job and you're trying to you go up against multiple people, how are you going to stand out? That may mean using the data to your advantage to speak to folks and help them understand. And that's really why that's important. So do a SWOT analysis. Do a look at your world. You know, write it down on a piece of paper. Look at your finances. How do you be self-reliant in today's world? How do you overcome challenges that are real and exist that, you know, quite frankly, are unprecedented? So here we are in the middle of 2024, you know, at the beginning of 2024. 
or an election season. Um, you know, there's short term risks. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty that will exist for this year to some degree. And employers will be in that same boat. It's going to just be the reality of what we're facing. So I just want to be clear on that. You know, how do you deal with that SWOT analysis? Um, so let's jump on to the next slide here. Um, tie corporate and org strategy to talent strategy. So if you're in a, and, and you can do this for your own family too. You know, what's your family's values? What are your circumstances? You know, you're the CEO of your own life. How do you get ahead of the curve? So tie corporate and org strategy to talent strategy, but do this for your own personal self as well. You know, work with your finance strategy teams to with those talents to help you grow, attract talent scale. Make sure your senior leadership on the same page. Um, you got to present business cases to them. They, they have to understand the reality of what's happening in the marketplace. You can use tools like Owler, Dun & Bradstreet, Google News, LinkedIn Analytics, Yahoo Finance to get a sense of the environment. What is the challenge? What are the trends that are affecting your industry or your region? Have frequent conversations with your critical strategy partners. Very, very important. So this is all key, uh, and this is why I'm talking about this today, is I think it's it's key to understand this stuff, and it's key to be able to overcome the realities of that have come as a result of these last three years. Let's just say for what it is, it has been an absolute roller coaster for everybody involved, and it's affecting life across the across the spectrum. It's also affecting mental health, and mental health is a real issue for organizations, families, and individuals. Be cognizant of it. Don't be afraid to talk about it. It's a very key issue to get you through what we're facing in 2024. Now, do you have workforce analytics? I'm going to talk about this for a minute. One of the biggest issues that I see uh, for talent acquisition and recruiting, and, and this, this applies to all industries, they don't look at, you know, the reality of, of what's happening. It's just like they go from one thing to another and it's, they're very, they're in a reactive state. And so again, I ask these questions, what's your attrition rate? Do you know how many people you're going to need next this year? You know, do you know it by site? Do you know it by region? Uh, what's your level of hiring entry level, mid-level and executive level? Are you tracking these? metrics? Are you looking at the demand in your world? So what basically happened in 2020 is all these organizations shut themselves down. And then all this free money was, was given by the government in the United States and the stimulus programs and people adapting to COVID, trying to figure out what was happening with it. All this pent up demand uh, was kept in for about a year. And so for about a year and a half from 2021 to 2022, we put more dollars into the economy and there were too few goods chasing those dollars or those dollars were chasing too few goods. That's the definition of inflation. So prices went up, people started to struggle, savings started to get depleted. Um, that's been keeping us afloat. You know, just recently, uh, there was a disconnect between the ADP jobs report and the report from the BLS. ADP showed 100,000 hires. The BLS showed 336,000 hires. So who do you believe? You know, it, the, the reality is, you know, if you're a professional, that inflation and all these things have affected you. You know that these things have hit you to a certain degree, but you haven't been able to explain it. So this is why this data is so key. As I look at this data and I think about, okay, what is going on in my workplace? It, you know, when I join my next organization, I'm going to be talking more and more about this stuff. What's your workforce planning strategy? What's your workforce analytics? What is your talent ROI? What's the revenue per employee? You know, folks are looking at, the, at you know, trying to make their organizations better. But the problem is, that some of the CEOs are acting as if, you know, we're back in 2008 when they over they failed to plan, and all of a sudden there's this big, you know, a 
disconnect and people leave the organization or they're let go because they overhired. Now, if they had gone ahead and stayed connected with the workforce planning and the attrition rate, when they hired all these recruiters to help them go find talent, and then all of a sudden their revenue sources dry up, what happens? They got stuck. So that's that's the reality of what we faced in this recent, you know, and this is my vlogcast. This is why I'm talking about this stuff. I want to make sure that people kind of hear it and that they understand the reality of these things because it's quite frankly, it's it's sad. Had the organizations planned better, they wouldn't have had layoffs. They wouldn't have had this reactive state. And that's why you have to have workforce analytics. So let me move to the next slide here. Um, Here's another thing. So a lot of organizations are, you know, they see artificial intelligence. It's a big shiny object, but are they are they keeping up? Or your, is your CTO, your chief tech officer, do they have a tech game plan and a talent plan to fill the the needs uh, to be competitive for tomorrow? Are they being ahead of the curve uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence? What are they doing to adapt, and and how will they adapt? Are you an early adopter or late adopter? What about AI? Are you engaging your younger professionals and put them on tech committees? Because they are really sharp and they know what they're doing. Gen Y, Gen Z, millennial, they know tech. You got to get them involved. Um, they, they're on the cutting edge. And organizations who also keep their older workers engaged and find a way to have some kind of harmony between all their generations and keep things coming along. Really what that takes is going from the top down. You got to have your mission, vision, values, and your vision for what your organization can do and accomplish in play, real time, focused. Otherwise, you're going to fail. You can't be reactive anymore. It just doesn't work. The, the reality is a lot of these organizations have been reactive these last few years. They didn't have a hiring plan. You know, going back to my last slide there, they they really messed it up. And that's why they had layoffs. It's a failure is what it is. So here's the next tip. Is your succession plan and retention plan sound? How is your attrition rate affecting the work of your talent teams? Are your workers doing more work than they were doing? Uh, if you just laid off a bunch of people, do you have a skeleton crew in your talent acquisition group? Do you have that in your HR teams? How much work are they doing? Are they overwhelmed? How are your employees feeling? The problem is that a lot of these organizations, again, being reactive, lose out on the succession plan funnel, and this, which basically means preparing future leaders for opportunities today. Are you spending more time growing or in retention replacement activities? This is, this is what happens in a reactive scenario. They lay off, the demand comes back, and then they're they're stuck. Whereas if they had just stayed consistent, they would have been better. Is your senior leadership engaged in sound key talent retention strategy? Are you using non-box ratings? A nine-box rating is basically uh, a, a rating that shows it's a nine-box, looks like a nine nine-box grid, and then you have your high potentials and your folks that have good strong performance and then those that are on the lower end of the spectrum but have might have potential where are your people is it unbiased very important is do you have a talent development strategy what does that mean you are basically looking at your key folks and giving them opportunities to grow today you're giving them stretch assignments you're giving you're keeping them engaged you're not losing those people you're finding a way to stay human in your organization you're getting back to candidates right away you are consistent. Unfortunately, that's the problem right now. Many of these organizations are not consistent and it's causing them issues. And that's why layoffs happen when they don't need to. So tip number six, what are the, what perks, benefits are key to attracting retained talent? You know, right now that remote work thing um, can be a differentiator for your organization. It could be the difference between you hiring and not getting top talent who's at the head of their curve. Are you offering competitive salaries? 
are your salaries taking into account your salaries and your compensation strategy and your benefits taking into account inflation and the key issues that have come in the last 12 months to two years. You see, this is a problem. It's, it's a big issue. It's affecting a lot of people, but organizations aren't addressing it. The ones that do address it are ahead of the curve. They're actually retaining their people. They're keeping their people happy. Do you have a sound strategy for using remote work? You know, unfortunately, many don't. They're just going a knee-jerk reaction. Oh, we had COVID. We need to be remote. Let's all go remote. Oh, now that we 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 know we have to have our people come back in the office for whatever reason, you know, the top says, oh, yeah, you need to have those people come back. However, the box has been open. It's not going away. Remote work's here to stay. Now, if, you, if you're one of those organizations that people feel like, oh, they just give the remote work to the top uh, executives, that's, that's that. People aren't going to trust your organization. You know, when you're trying to fill key roles, your talent brand is going to suffer. You will not be able to get people hired. So there's a, there's a lot of organizations that are treating their people like widgets, not human beings. The, it's this... Um, it's like the humanity went out the window. Humanize, humanize, humanize. If you're a worker that is trying to get back to a job and there's tons of competition, humanize, meaning go to your professional associations, get involved there. That's that's the key to being able to get a job, getting ahead of the curve before that role comes out and there's 10,000 people applying. That's the reality. So that's that's some of what I'm talking about. Anyway, just something to think about, but I want to be clear. This is an absolutely critical thing, and this is a tip for everybody. So my next tip, um, what does your talent identification strategy look like? Do you have a sourcing function who's forward thinking, engaging talent real time? They're thinking ahead of the curve before roles emerge. You've done your trending analysis. You've done your market uh, analytics, you've done your workforce planning and you know what your, your demand is likely to be like, and you've planned accordingly for that. That's what that means is your sourcing function, forward thinking, engaging talent, real time or reactive. Are your sources and recruiters actively engaged talent ahead of needs? Are your hiring managers out at industry events? And is your company sponsoring professional associations? That's the sweet spot. So a lot of these organizations are not. And the ones who want to attract talent, I, I got a call the other day from a manager who wanted to, um, he got me on the phone. He started talking about how he wanted to hire recruiters, but he's had some turnover. And it was it was as he was speaking, he goes, I don't believe in remote work. I like to be hands-on. I like to stand by my people. He was two, two mistakes. The gentleman is old school thinking and does not think that remote work can work and it can, but he's not willing to invest in the metrics because he wants to be able to observe his people. And he thinks that's easier. And it's the way he's always done it. He said, so, Immediately, I knew that was a red flag in the interview process with that particular hiring manager. Why? Because he's not forward thinking. What does your talent identification strategy look like? Are your hiring managers out of industry events? Are they engaged? Are they keeping abreast of the changes in the workforce and the real life issues that have come as a result of the COVID factor? where remote work has come to play, where mental health has come to play, where more and more people need the human connection and you've got to figure it out. Are you using diversity and inclusion strategies? If your diversity and inclusion strategy is forward thinking and you are engaging talent real, real time and you're getting that diversity right, you're getting people to the table from all walks of life, your organization is going to be powerful because when your workforce reflects your customer base, suddenly there's power there and revenue comes more readily. So 
industry industry benchmarks. What it, where's your company compare to critical categories against peers? How much market share do you have? Are you seen as the go-to employer in your industry? How does your talent brand strategy compare to other organizations? Are you winning the war, the talent war, or behind? What are the root causes? So root causes are inflexible management, failure to plan, the inability or the unwillingness to be flexible in terms of work arrangements, the inability to provide a fair and equitable compensation rate. I've seen senior, here's an example of organizations who are in reactive mode. They want to invest in recruiters and only pay them a senior recruiter 50K to 65K and that's it. They're not willing to go above. So the issue is, you know, they're, they're behind the curve. They don't even use compensation planning to help with their compensation plan and, and mark and benchmark the market. They're not doing it. And those organizations will struggle with talent in the future. Maybe there's talent that's readily available today that they think will take a job and they think they can get away with bad employment practices. But I'm telling you, it's going to injure you. It's going to hurt you. It's going to set you back. So if you're not a forward thinking organization and you're not doing best practices, the end game is going to be really ugly and you could become bankrupt or your company may fail. Many more companies fail because they fail to plan. That's the reality. So that's, that's my opinion on that one. I want to go to the next thing. Um, top leadership sets the tone. This is, this is so important to me. I can't even tell you. How does your organization see talent? How does your CEO, your key leadership, your founder, do they believe that people truly are the most important aspect of your business? Because if that sets the tone, and the trend line is going in a certain direction, but your your top leadership doesn't see it. There's a disconnect, and eventually they're going to fail. It's the the earlier information that I shared and the trend lines that I shared earlier in this this uh, call and presentation. The reality is, so many organizations aren't setting the tone. Now, look at the some of the most successful organizations on the planet. I, I want to call out Handshake. I think Handshake, the uh, intern platform, does a really good job of this. I think Hire Easy is another example. Um, Seek Out, another recruiting example. ADP, another example that comes to mind. Each of these organizations, what have they done? They've done these steps. They have a clear employment value proposition. They've invested time and energy in their employment brand. It's connected to the top. And the strategy is sound. It's not just they're walking the talk and they're also doing the action. When it comes to diversity, they're also setting the tone. They're doing the right thing. They're working to ensure that they have diverse interview panels. They're making candidates feel comfortable in the interview process. They're getting back to candidates and they're closing the loop. There are so many organizations who are overwhelmed because they cut their talent acquisition teams to the bare bones and now they're paying the price their employment brand is going to suffer. That's the reality. Now, talking about this is, re is I hope, uh, preaching to the choir out there, but it is an issue. And, and you know, I, I have another presentation I could set up that shows why, you know, organizations are struggling to fill jobs still, even though there's a plethora of talent, it's because they cut back on their investment in talent acquisition. They cut back on their investment of talent in general, thinking it was a cost center when it should be tied to revenue. And that's the big, big issue right there. This is why you got to be on the same page with your senior leadership. You got to show them this stuff, have to help them understand it. If they don't, you're fighting a losing battle. That's really what it comes down to. So is your whole organization aware? Are teams in your company aware of company initiatives? Do they, does everybody know what other teams are working on? Or are they working in a silo? This is another issue that I've seen that creates a whole bunch of bottlenecks and inefficiencies. And, and throughout my career, I've seen this. And so how do you overcome this? Well, what you do is you make sure you have a clear path of communication. You have a clear place 
to disseminate ideas and incubate ideas and then create new entrepreneurship within your organization. So I'm like you're doing, um, you're being an entrepreneur in your own organization. Even if you're a big organization, you could have a the heartbeat of this and and the, the organizations who embrace the ideas of their people start to succeed. Are all generations working together and using their strengths? Is there a clear path of communication? Does your organization collaborate cross-functionally? What events foster innovation and new ideas? You know, just a hackathon. Sometimes, you know, a hackathon is something where software engineers get together and they go and they do code and they, you know, they, they come up with new ideas to solve a problem. You can use that same kind of agile focus to create maximum awareness in your organization and maximum engagement you're capturing their ideas you're putting awesome people who are coming up want to suggest ideas to work and you're giving them opportunities to grow and rewarding them for sharing ideas and not penalizing them for doing so the best leaders i know the ones the managers who succeed and keep their people for years are the ones who invest time and energy to hear ideas from their people and then invest those ideas and get behind them employment or employer uh, sorry employee owned organizations are powerful when they have a sense of ownership they do amazing things and so that's really the whole gist of this so i hope this was somewhat helpful um, i'm no longer at the source and recruit company my email is mike.rasmussen02 at gmail.com that i was there but there's my LinkedIn below. You can connect with me there. Um, so finally, I just want to, you know, talk about this. The reason I shared all this today was because we are dealing with unique circumstances that are crazy. So, for example, let me show you a, a recruiter job here. So if you go to jobs and you look at any job that's out there, for example, you could you could start let's just try software engineer right now so take a look and see how many people have applied and you'll see just how many there are that have done certain things so you know these this one has 99 applicants um how do you stand out from the competition for a role that you want well you start kind of getting a feel for what they're looking for and why. Let, let's look at some HR jobs. So if you're an HR professional, for example, uh, you're going to see a lot of applications for one job that's remote. So let's just find, you know, on-site roles. You're going to have less applicants, see? So this, this is a really interesting phenomenon. But watch when you go remote what happens. So there's a lot of remote roles. So remote is definitely here to stay, but here's what's interesting. When you look at recruiting, for example, you know, they all have over, this one has over a hundred applicants, okay? That one, a hundred applicants. This one, 33. So, you know, there's definitely jobs out there in the recruiting space. Those of us who've been laid off um, and are trying to, you know, keep on top of everything you know, you, you're going to see a bunch of different things. So from a job search perspective today with all these issues that are around us and with us, how do you stand out? Well, you, you've got to get involved in your professional associations. You've got to be engaged and you've got to keep trying to do what is needful to be successful. That may mean doing things that other people aren't doing, picking up the phone, making calls, uh, doing, you know, you got to humanize the recruiting process. Get out there and volunteer at your industry events. Get, you know, get ahead of the curve. You can do this proactive step in your own life, and it's very key. So I just want to talk. I mean, that's something I'll talk about in another video, but I wanted to show this as the reality of what we have been facing for so long lately. And I hope this was valuable to you. I hope you, this was helpful to you. Uh, I hope this was something that you'll see that will help you be successful in your career as you go forward. But I want you to know this is the reality. This is what we faced. We have gone through a lot. Um, 
that's it for me today in this segment of where's your next talent stream. Um, I will be back on soon with another video um, and another live stream. Hope this was good. And I hope it helps you to be successful in your life and just to be aware of the data and the just the, the environment we are in. I call it the strategic environment, the strategic reality of, of what we've been through. It's, it's, it's real, guys. It's something that's not going away anytime soon. So just something to think about. I hope this is helpful to someone out there. Signing off from Where's Your Next. Peace. Thanks for being here. Mike out.